Today we're going to be taking a quick trip down to Summit Avenue in St. Paul, Minnesota. Now Summit Avenue is a street that is pretty well known for being for the rich, famous, uh, influential, and well-to-do families of Minnesota. Including such people as uh, politicians, high-powered business people, and industry leaders. And one of the more well-known houses on that street happens to be the James J. Hill House. Designed and built by the Boston firm of Peabody, Stearns & Ferber, the James J. Hill House was built as a Richardsonian Romanesque-style mansion, which at the time was very much in fashion. The final cost of the mansion totaled $931,275.01, which includes all of the construction, furnishings, and landscaping for the three-acre estate. Even just taking inflation into account and not any of the changes in construction or wage labor, the three-acre estate today would cost somewhere around $35 million. When it was completed in 1891, the mansion was the largest and most expensive home in Minnesota. And it's pretty obvious to see why, because the house happened to contain 36,500 square feet, spaced out over five floors, 13 bathrooms, 22 fireplaces, 16 cut glass chandeliers, a two-story skylit art gallery, 88-foot reception hall, a profusion of elaborately carved oak and mahogany woodwork, a three-story pipe organ created by the renowned Boston organ maker George Hutchings, and a sophisticated mechanical system that went throughout the mansion for central heating, gas, and electric lighting, as well as plumbing, ventilation, security, and communication. The home served as the center for the public and private lives of the Hill family for the following 30 years. Children grew up in the house. Four of the daughters had their weddings in the large drawing room, and newlyweds, as was pretty common in the time, actually lived with their parents in the house until their own homes were completed. And they still stayed pretty close to mommy and daddy because five of those homes were built close by, still on Summit Avenue. Which then made it rather easy for those adult children to bring their own children over to meet grandma and grandpa later in life. In 1925, family members purchased the mansion from the estate and presented it to the Catholic Archdiocese of St. Paul, where for the next half century, the structure served as an office building, school, and residence for the church. And then the Historical Society of Minnesota acquired the house in 1978, and it was recognized as a National Historic Landmark in 1961. But how about the lives of the people who lived there? In this case, mainly James J. Hill and his wife, Mary Hill. James happened to be the child of Irish immigrants, who had the unfortunate childhood experience of having his father pass away on Christmas Day when he was 14 years old. To help support his family, 14-year-old James decided to go to work on the Mississippi River as a mud clerk, which is about as glamorous of a job as it sounds. Eventually, he worked his way out of the mud clerk position and began working for local railways and in transportation. His work with local railways as a young adult led to him being able to own the Northern Railway. The Northern Railway happens to be the first railway to connect Minnesota to the Pacific Ocean, in this case specifically Washington State. And to help garner interest and use in the railway, James J. Hill happened to subsidize fruit agriculture, which incentivized farmers out west to ship their fruits towards the cold climate of Minnesota, particularly during the winter, which helped along the tradition of giving fruit at Christmas, even in climates like Minnesota. And while I'm not entirely sure if James J. Hill has anything to do with this, I actually have a tendency to get either apples or pears in my stocking, rather than the more traditional Satsuma. And the reason that I specifically point out James possibly having something to do with this is due to Washington apples being particularly popular for his fruit agriculture subsidizing. In fact, technically not actually related to James J. Hill himself other than sharing his name, there happens to be a type of Washington apple called Jim Hill apples. 
The Great Northern Railway was also known for its Empire Builder passenger train, which operated service to the West Coast by way of Glacier National Park. Despite antitrust proceedings that forced Hill to divest from his other railroad interests, the Great Northern weathered economic downturns and proved to be profitable for most of the 20th century. Ironically enough, the same railroads that Hill was forced to give up due to those antitrust proceedings ended up merging with the Great Northern in 1970 to form the Burlington Northern. And that new network merged with another historic railroad and a considerable portion of the Great Northern now operate. And even Amtrak continues to offer service on the Empire Builder passenger train. As for James transitioning from a bachelor to a married man, as a young man in 1864, he met a waitress who happened to be working at the Merchant's Hotel in St. Paul, where he happened to often eat his lunch while he was on work. Her name was Mary Teresa Mahagan. She happened to be born in New York City and was also the child of Irish immigrants, just like James and her family happened to settle in the then frontier town of St. Paul in 1850. They spent some time courting and flirting. Eventually, James did propose to Mary. However, since they were of two completely different social standings, he did happen to send Mary off to finishing school in Milwaukee before their marriage in 1867 to prepare her for the impending change in her social status and lifestyle. Over the next 18 years of marriage, they had 10 children named Mary, James, Louis, Clara, Catherine, who unfortunately did die in infancy, Charlotte, Ruth, Rachel, Gertrude, and Walter. Louis succeeded James as president of the Great Northern Railway and lived next door with his family at 260 Summit Avenue. Meanwhile, Mary did very much use the education that she had received at St. Mary's Institute in French, history, music, calisthenics, and where she excelled in needlework, tapestry, crocheting, and knitting. In her new role on the James J. Hill House as the wife and lady of the house. She was often commented on spending much of her time doing needlework or knitting for the poor, working for her children, making sure that the house was tidy and up and ready to go at all times, taking care of the children, considering that over those 18 years of marriage, she did have 10 children, so she was almost always either pregnant or chasing after a toddler that was just learning how to walk. She used this new education to be the perfect lady of the house. She entertained, gave to charities, ran the household, managed the 10 to 12 full-time house staff, and the who knows how many part-time or temporary staff that would be brought on for special occasions. She happened to make her own wine from North Oaks grapes, which while technically legal during prohibition for Mary to make her own wine, what was illegal was where she gifted the wine to friends throughout the country. Granted, I do think that at the time she realized she was now of a social standing where she really didn't have to care about the legality anymore. Following her husband's death, Mary actually actively managed her own financial affairs. She helped with the details surrounding the completions of the James J. Hill Reference Library in St. Paul and contributed to its endowment. She also arranged all the trust for her children, grandchildren, and longtime servants and she created trust for the St. Paul Catholic institutions, which still produce income today, as she was a very religious woman. In fact, in acknowledgement of her many gifts to Catholic education, in 1959, the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis dedicated a new high school in her honor. Hill High School, which is now known as Hill Murray High School, after it merged with the Archbishop Murray High School in 1971. The tour that I happened to go on happened to be the Christmas tour, so a lot of what I was physically seeing had to do with the holiday season in the house. In the case of the James J. Hill House, this meant a rather subdued amount of decoration due to Mary's emphasis on the religious aspects of Christmas. This was combined with the harrying efforts of the servants to get the traditional holiday festivities up and running. From what was described to me, it all frankly reminded me of working retail right before the holidays. 
These festivities were by exclusive invite and often involved being served an obscene amount of food, but making sure that you don't eat all that you're given or you might be viewed as not high enough status to belong at the- and This was before having the tables cleared away for a long night of dancing and socializing. Of course, the children and grandchildren of the house would find ways to entertain themselves during this time. That was really more of an adult time for showing off wealth rather than how we often see Christmas today for children to be excited by their toys. Especially with how Mary specifically did emphasize the religious aspects of the holiday over the materialistic consumption that Christmas is often associated with today. One example of how the children would find ways to entertain themselves during the holiday season would be a story that happened to be told by two grandchildren of James and Mary Hill. Despite the lack of ostentatious decoration, there still was one Christmas tree that was left up in the house and decorated with the traditional baubles and odds and ends, along with mini cornucopias that instead of being filled with fruit were filled with tiny candies. And despite the fact that they were not really allowed to have those sweets, children being children of course would grab the cornucopias from the tree, sneak behind the tree, and eat the candies. The thing was, another decoration on Christmas trees at that time happened to be lit candles. As electricity was not terribly common at the time, and tiny LED lights that we might find today, even less so, in that they didn't exist at the time. So instead of electric lights, the tree would be decorated with candles that were lit for viewing. And whenever those candles happened to be lit, there was always a servant that was assigned to stand just behind the tree with a bucket of water, so that should there be any candle flames that go a little bit astray and start setting everything else on fire, they have the bucket of water there to put out the flames before it takes down the entire tree. So of course when the children and grandchildren of the James J. Hill house hiding behind the Christmas tree to eat their stolen sweet, they would of course find themselves face to face with the servant holding a bucket and just staring stonily at them. Lucky for them, any servant that was assigned to this task happened to be very chill and did not rat them out to Mary. So thanks to any accomplished servants, even the children could find something about the holidays to be happy about. And there we have it, a glimpse into the James J. Hill house, and with it, a peek into the rich and famous of early Minnesotan statehood. If you happen to like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment down below on any places around the Twin Cities that you would like me to visit next. I do have an ever-growing list of people and places that I never even thought to look into before. So this has been kind of an exciting way to look into the people and places right here in my own backyard. And make sure to hit that subscribe button if you want to see more of my videos. I'll talk to you next time. All for now. Bye.